مصطفى هاشيمي a subject matter expert in nutritional science and alternative medicine and known for his for his for his uh, researches in a cognitive development at CSI. So, uh, هو متخصص في الغذاء الصحيح والفيتامينز والنيوتريشن وهيكلمنا بكل صراحة بعيدة عن الأهداف التجارية والإعلانات اللي احنا بنشوفها كل يوم هنتكلم معاه في هذه التفاصيل فرحبوا معايا مع مصطفى هاشيمي هاي هاو ار يو مصطفى هاو ار يو دون ثانك يو فيري جود فيري جود ذيس از كونسيدر لايك ذيس ساينس از لايك ريليتيفلي نو اي مين اتس نوت لايك فروم 100 ييرز اجو يس كوركت اي مين اي مين ذا سبجكت اون اون ذيس لايك يو نو وي هاف سين ذيس اي مين اي مين ريسنتلي Everybody's talking about diet, nutrition, food, yeah. vitamins, supplementary. Mm. You know, it's all, all this stuff is new, barely new, right? It, it's, it's relatively a newer science, correct? A newer and, science. Yeah, and uh, also one of the most controversial sciences. So, for example, yeah. with biology, with physics, you know, with physics, you, you pick up a rock, you know, gravity is going to pull it down. No one changes this view. This view state remains from day one. It's been proven over and over again. Wow. Nutrition is the only science where... 20 years ago, they told you eggs are bad for you. Don't eat eggs. Now, it's now all of a sudden, 20 years later, okay, it's okay to eat eggs. No other science does this. It's really nutrition. very confused. You know, confused. A lot of uh, every day we see something new. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, it's it is one of the most controversial sciences. Yeah. Um, but the, I think the um, the disconnect is really not in the research and not with the science itself. Uh, a lot of the researchers and the scientists in the field, they agree on many things. Yeah, there's going to be small differences here and there. Mm -hmm. Overall, everyone's in agreement. I think the confusion comes with the general public. Um, yeah. And then the reason for that, uh, according to my understanding, what I've seen, uh, is because of mostly the media and the, the health and food industry itself. Exactly. Yeah. But why is uh, nutrition is so complicated and why do so many experts offer, you know, different views? Uh, there is any proven research that all can agree on? So I think there are many views that all can agree on. Um, one of which uh, right now is okay. that the majority of the population is nutrient deficient. So we're eating a lot more food now than we were, say, like 100 years ago. Oh, yeah? But our, our deficiency is higher now than it was in the past. Um, we're having in increases in inflammation. There's increases in disease pathology all across the world. Not only here in America, but you mean everywhere. Eating uh, uh, it's more processed food, or, or correct? Yeah. So that's that's one of the uh, the culprits is processed foods, uh -huh. high sugary foods, um, things that are not found necessarily in nature that are man-made uh, that are now leading to a lot of the disease states that we're seeing in a lot of people. Yeah. And what's the difference between like you know alternative and the conventional medicine? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, I, I believe the main difference is with conventional medicine. Uh, so that's like your typical doctor, emergency room type of physician, right. general yeah. practitioner. The thing is, they're great at what they do, which is mostly for emergency situations. Okay. So let's say, you know, you have a burn, you have a heart attack. They are amazing good at this. that. Right. So when it comes to chronic problems maybe not so much. That's where you want to really target lifestyle and chronic issues and, and mm -hmm. maybe look in a different route. So I'll give you an example. Yes. If you have a runny nose, you go to the emergency room or you go to your doctor. Yeah. They're going to give you an antihistamine Antipiety. or something, yeah. something that's going to stop you from having a runny nose. Right. Whereas an alternative medicine, it's a little more complex. They look at why did you get the runny nose? What is the cause? In conventional medicine, they're putting a band-aid on the problem. You have this problem, we're going to give you this to stop that problem. In alternative medicine, it's more what caused that problem in the first place. Was it a food allergy? Was it an environmental trigger? Um, we want to address the underlying cause yeah, of that. But this will take some time. Yeah. I mean, it takes time to to. It takes to a lot treat. more time, correct. Yeah, and if, if you really look at it, I mean, uh, you know, medical doctors, their, their time is limited. You know, they're maybe like, the average, actually, the statistic, the latest one I read, uh, a, a patient spends less than a minute with their medical doctor. Yeah. Um, so that's why you want to really kind of 
in, in, inform yourself yes. and partner with people who can spend more time with you where you can uncover the underlying causes of these disease states. Yeah, but for alternative medicine, you know, if I visit the doctor, I'm going to spend some time so he can ask me, he will find out where, where this is a food or, or maybe environment or, you know, something. Yeah. So, but at the end of, the, of my visit, I'm getting a medicine or no? So this depends on person to person, case to case. Yeah. Um, I believe with long term, and again, this is my opinion. Um, it's not based on, you know, I'm, uh -huh. I'm not quoting anybody here. So I believe that if you have a chronic problem, like let's say you have diabetes, for example, right? This and type 2 diabetes, that's the one where you're still producing insulin, but yes. it's not being transported properly. It's not like type 1 where you're not producing insulin at all. Right. You need injections. Right. So with type 2 diabetes, this is more of a lifestyle disease. Um, you're eating foods or you're inactive or there are certain lifestyle factors that are contributing to this disease. And if you simply make modifications, the research has shown you can reverse yourself out of type 2 diabetes oh, okay. without the intervention of medication. I mean, again, um, I'm not suggesting that the viewers yeah. do this themselves. Anytime you are starting any dietary um, program mm -hmm. or supplement, you know, you want to partner with your healthcare practitioner or your primary care physician before you start something. But generally speaking, if you do take this route, the results have been very favorable for most who do that. So, okay, I, so you mean a nutrition can... Uh you know, uh, alone can heal people with uh, chronic diseases? So yes and no. Yes and no, because um, there are variability among the population. Mm -hmm. So meaning I can give 10 people, give me 10 people. They can be the same family, okay. the same genetics, everything's the same. Okay. We give them the same diet, same exercise, same everything. It's very possible to have 10 different outcomes because so many factors wow. go into this. Yeah. So there's no one size fits all when it comes to nutrition or supplementation. Everyone's an individual and everyone has to be looked at as an individual. So certain people may respond well to nutritional therapies, supplementation, whereas others may not. They may need the medication. They may need something more advanced. So I, I would say it's a case by case basis. But there have been many times where these, uh, you know, in, when you're doing mm -hmm. nutritional changes and lifestyle changes, it's been shown to be a positive outcome where you don't need necessarily the medications. So whom should I go to if I would like to uh, know more about nutrition, about my body yeah. nutrition, you know, so. Th th that's a good question. So I would start with your primary care physician. Okay. Um, right now, uh, as far as I'm noticing in, in mainstream medicine, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of friends who are doctors and pharmacists, um, and, I, and I, I work with a lot of them too. So I noticed that they are moving more towards preventive medicine, meaning, you know, right now the state of medicine is we wait for something to be wrong with us, we wait for something to happen, and then we go see a doctor. So the way medicine is, is, for, is changing now in America especially is we want to take preventive steps to prevent a problem from happening. So okay. I'm, I'm caring about my health more, like how can I prevent a heart disease or how can I prevent diabetes versus I'm going to wait for diabetes to happen to me, then I'm going to try to reverse myself so out of it. So it's a prevention. Preventive medicine would be the yeah, best. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I think it's really up to the individual to do their own research. Uh, it's not that hard. I mean, you, you study basic nutrition. You know, most people know what foods are healthy and, and unhealthy. I mean, the general consensus is we know fruits and vegetables are good for us. You know, we know sugar is not so good for us. Something that comes in a package is maybe not the best thing to eat. If it grows on the ground or we can pick it from a tree or we can hunt it, generally we know this, these foods are very nutritious for us, whereas in a, in a wrapper, maybe not so healthy. Yeah, but, you know, uh, things change every day, you know, with the researches and we hear different views, different opinion. Yeah. So uh, for, for those people who that want to lose weight, yes. is it important to them to watch what they eat or to watch the amount of food they're going to they, they eat? Or, or both, or you know, so because uh, we hear from one nutrition or from a doctor, you know, if you eat, let's say, uh, an orange, it's not good. The banana, it's another guy say good, and the other uh, nutrition say no. Yeah. So, how this things works? Yeah. So, so this actually plays into the confusion. Your first question: yeah. Why? Why is there so much confusion? Yeah. So this is when. Um, 
the marketing people uh, or anyone, like let's say a doctor or some s expert that's on the payroll of, of some company. Right. They're going to try to sell you their book. They're going to try to sell you their program. Any other program or book doesn't it's work. It's every day we have this. Yeah so, yeah, so they take a shred of truth and they partner it with misconception and they sell that to the general public. So it, the, the takeaway is avoid anything that promises little work with big results because that's not how the human it's system works. It's not happening. And I, I, I would be weary of that because th that's not how the human body works. You can't do nothing or little and get a big result. It's just not. Um, the, the science shows lifestyle, dietary factors, 80 to 90 percent of your success in health depends on this. Then when it comes to supplementation or, or medication, yes. maybe 10 percent it can help you, but it's predominantly your lifestyle and dietary factors that are going to play a role in this. And when it comes to, like you mentioned, the banana and the orange, yeah. so we can get into the physiology of that, but, yeah. but generally speaking, we know like those are healthy foods for us. So if, if, I'm, if I'm talking to the viewers and they're telling me, is it okay to eat a banana and orange, I would say that's a better choice than a Snickers bar or you know yeah. so, some uh, ice cream or something like that uh, oh, okay. if, you know if you're going low carb then you know there are implications where you maybe don't want to do that because it can kick you out of uh, yeah. a diet that you you maybe heard of uh, ket ketosis a keto diet so if you're doing high carbohydrate it may take you out of that and how about those uh, uh, you know vitamins i mean uh, or supplements are they enough for someone to live on it so again, a really good question and a lot of confusion. Um, ideally, uh, and most experts agree, you're gonna take most of your nutrition from your food. So that means eating lots of uh, a variety of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, you know, animal proteins, um, depending on your view and, and your ethical and nutritional values. Uh, then you're obviously gonna run into some kind of nutritional deficiency. Like right now, the big one is vitamin D. You may have heard of right. across the country, everybody's vitamin D deficient. It plays a role in your immune system, in your mood, uh, in your hormone regulation. So I would say start with trying to get everything from your food and then you can partner with your doctor. You could do uh, some, blood, some blood work to figure out what you're deficient in. And if you're not sure or you don't have the time or the money to do this, I would say a good multivitamin, it's kind of like an insurance policy. It covers your gaps in your diet. So it's not going to make up for a bad diet. Like you can't eat McDonald's three times a day and take a multivitamin and think I'm going to be healthy. It doesn't work like that. Oh, uh, okay. It's going to be that you do your best to get everything from your diet and then whatever gaps you have, the multivitamin or whatever vitamins or minerals you may want to take would fill in your deficiencies. Yeah, so I don't have to get like, you know, take a B12, uh, vitamin D, uh, whatever is uh, multivitamins, Centrum, uh, you know, yeah. should, I mean, it's too, too much, too much, you know. Yeah. I mean, when I go to the vitamin shop, it's too much confusing and everyone over there trying to sell yeah. something. So Yeah, so, so the thing, that's where it comes to um, everyone's an individual okay. and, you know, different strokes for different folks. So depending on you, like you really kind of have to do the footwork and see where your diet takes you and how you feel and, you know, different supplements do different things. So most disease states, and again, this is agreed upon in the alternative um, community as well as the conventional medicine, most disease states come from nutrient deficiencies, the majority of them. Oh, okay. We're not getting certain nutrients, we're deficient in certain things that are leading to immediate disease states or long-term disease states. I see. So if you fill in these deficiencies, that's where the whole supplement industry came from is, you know, people were getting, you know, uh, sailors were not getting access to produce and they would get, you know, bleeding gums and swollen gums and they'd get scurvy. And, and that's how we found out of all these diseases. And uh, that's where the FDA stepped in and they made the minimum recommendation for all your vitamins and minerals every day. Our bodies don't produce vitamins and minerals. We have to get them from food or supplements. Um, every day we need a certain amount to balance okay. different systems in the body. So what, when I go to the vitamin shop, when I pick any of the vitamins, yeah. how do I know this is like FDA or how do I know if I read in what part it's too much written on? Oh. Yeah. So for me that I work in the industry, yes. it's confusing. So I can imagine for the general yeah, public how confusing general. it is. So the FDA, they also can't seem to agree on a lot of things. So right now, like we, we just mentioned the vitamin D. Yeah. 
So everybody's vitamin D deficient, and the FDA uh, re recommendation for vitamin D is extremely low. It was, for many years, 400 international units. Um, now they raise it to 500 international units. Most experts still believe that's extremely low. You need a lot more than that, generally speaking. Oh. So um, how do you know which vitamins are good and, and that? So the FDA doesn't regulate vitamins or minerals. They're considered a dietary supplement. So good. a dietary supplement is basically like a vitamin, a mineral, an amino acid, an herb, um, anything that's orally consumed that's not either a drug or food. Um, uh, with, with my company, for example, and a lot of the people in, in our industry, we want the FDA to regulate so then we can have that standard. But the problem is, um, I mean, there's a lot of pol political uh, variables here involved as Absolutely. well. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So like, let's say with fish oil, there's thousands of studies. I think fish oil is probably the most studied dietary supplement on the market. Mm -hmm. um, well over thousands of studies on fish oil with the benefits. We know it's good for brain health, eye health, cardiovascular health joint health. Um, it may help children with focus. So the FDA, they have a fish oil product, right? So the old adage, you can't, if you can't beat them, join them. They sell a fish oil um, called Lavaza, which I believe retails for about $80. Whereas if you go to a regular vitamin store, you can probably get a, a good quality fish oil for about a quarter of that price. So that's where these kind of things play, play in as so well. So how people know about that? I mean I, I would say, you know, stop into, well, first of all, speak to an expert in the field who can recommend you something. Right. Um, do your research because I think the best way is knowledge. You just seek knowledge yourself. Um, I mean, it's your health, you know, so like when you buy a car or a house, you do your research. You don't yeah. just buy the first thing on the market. Exactly, so yeah. same thing with your health. You right. need to do some research, find out which companies are reputable, which companies meet label claims and you know which ones have the fewest binders fillers and you can talk to experts at you know at many of these stores they have people who are knowledgeable in this topic and they can answer these questions or for the you. fda website recommend what so fda they they it's kind of tricky because with their recommendations yeah they give you the minimum recommendations to prevent a disease so like for example uh with vitamin d they'll give you the minimum amount to prevent rickets um, this doesn't mean that you're necessarily healthy. It just means they're giving you enough so you're not going to get this disease. So disease is here and optimal health is here. So you have a really big window to play with. So you, you don't necessarily just want to be here. You want to be more on this side. Yeah. So that's where you get, and a lot of people, you bring up a good point, a lot of people get you know, kind of freaked out or nervous like, oh my God, I'm taking 10,000 times the amount of vitamin B12 is this healthy for me? Am I going to have a problem? So once you study a little bit about supplements and nutrition, you'll understand that it's really not a cause for concern because uh, a lot of people are deficient in B12 um, and a lot of people are lacking energy. So B12 will help kind of fill in those gaps and B12 plays a huge role in energy production in the body. It's also a water-soluble vitamin, meaning um, whatever your body doesn't absorb, it Im immediately gets excreted. So you don't have to really worry about toxicity. Uh, I mean, sure, it can happen, but the chances of it happening are very unlikely versus you being deficient in, in that specific vitamin. Absolutely. So uh, on the other side, you know, some diets uh, encourage like one or two, uh, what they call it, uh, sheet meat meals. Cheat, cheat meals, yeah. Cheat meal. Uh, yeah. yeah you, you cheat the meals uh, maybe once a week. Uh, and this help preventing the craving yeah, so you, you bring up an interesting point again. So with the famous cheat meal, and I, and I, I would like uh, the viewers to be clear that I personally don't recommend a cheat day. I recommend a cheat meal like you mentioned. Oh. Um, meaning because most people, like let's say if your goal is weight loss, um, and, and this is a, a huge topic, maybe if, if we, time allows in the future, we can get into you know, a separate segment on that. Um, but with weight loss, so your metabolism is smarter than you think your body's a lot smarter than you think a lot of people they just cut calories they want to lose weight they cut calories right so most people the average person let's say for the sake of argument eats 2000 calories a day okay so i want to lose weight i'm going to eat 1500 calories a day that's great for a while so what happens is over time your body's going to start dropping the metabolism it's going to get used to the 1500 calories so you'll lose weight essentially but then you're going to hit a plateau which i'm sure many people have faced this Absolutely. then what do you do from there then the solution again people drop calories so let's say you drop to 1000 calories 
okay, so you'll lose some weight, and then over time your, met your metabolism catches up and it drops, um, and then now it's set at, at 1,000. So what do you do there? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm stuck, I have to keep dropping, right? Now I drop to 500, I'll lose a little bit of weight, but eventually at 500, that's extremely low calories. My metabolism set point is now 500. So I'm dieting, I'm dieting, I'm dieting. Time is passing, I'm not losing weight. So I say, you know what, forget this. I'm gonna go back to 2,000 calories. What do you think is gonna happen when I go back to 2,000 calories from 500 calories? <sighs> That's just going to be a big, so, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. big change. So, so most of the weight that people, that's like called yo-yo dieting. Most of the weight that people lost, right. they're going to rebound it and possibly gain more. Because the thing is with fat cells, once you create a new fat cell, you can never get rid of it. You can always make new fat cells, but once you have them, you can only shrink them. You can't actually get rid of them ever. Oh. Um, so this is the problem that a lot of people face. So to your point, back to the cheat meal. Um, so... You're, I would say there's two benefits to that. There's the psychological benefit and then there's the physiological benefit. So let's say you're, we'll go back to the 2000 calorie example. You want to cut to 1500. So you're going to do this, let's say, um, and not necessarily every week, maybe every 10 to 14 days or whenever you get a craving, you, like you feel that, hey, um, I'm really craving such, like let's say you're doing a low carb. I want bread. I want something. Um, I would say basically when you're starting to feel those cravings after a week or so has passed, schedule it, plan it, and make it, um, they call it a refeed. So you, you plan it and you schedule it in your calendar, on this day I'm going to have it. And I would do it more towards the night because uh, the way the body works, I mean again we can go into the details later, but it, you, you uh -huh. have circadian rhythms and hormonal patterns. If you eat this meal later at night, there's less chance for you to store it as, as fat versus eating it earlier in the day. And then when you eat it earlier in the day, it's going to trigger this effect in the brain where you just want more and more throughout the day. Yeah, but many people believe when you eat at night, it's by, you know, eat before bed, make you fat. Yeah. So th this is another um, myth that's not really scientifically proven. Actually, it's the opposite. Um, eating breakfast has now been shown to that's going to make you that actually sh shuts fat burning off for the most part because most people are eating carbohydrates for breakfast they're right. eating a bagel they're eating yeah. oatmeal they're eating a cereal bar exactly so in the morning when you have a carbohydrate you release insulin uh, because you have sugar in the blood and insulin is released from the pancreas to clear out that uh, blood sugar and once you, you do this, you essentially turn fat burning off. Um, there's another hormone that goes against insulin. It's moving insulin. all day. Exactly. So you actually turn the fat burning off because insulin's there to clear the blood. It, it shuts down lipolysis, fat burning, when you have the presence of insulin. And then uh, to your point, like let's say some people, there's this fat of eating six meals a day, eight meals a day, you speed up your metabolism. Uh, so the research actually shows that the more meals you're eating, you're increasing insulin throughout the day uh, over versus just three meals a day you're actually hindering your fat loss because you're not burning fat when you're eating and you're never really giving your chance your body a chance to go into lipolysis because you have insulin constantly being secreted throughout the so day what do you recommend so i recommend um me personally i recommend if you can i mean again partner with your doctor before you start anything but skipping breakfast, there's this whole um, notion now of intermittent fasting. The research is very, very, um, very big right now with intermittent fasting. Meaning, you know, you either have a no carbohydrate breakfast, you eat more fats and proteins, or you just skip it all together. Um, and it has a host of benefits. Uh, some you get of which, your first meal like during the lunch. Exactly. So essentially, you're playing to hormonal patterns. So your cortisol, your stress hormone is the highest when you wake up. And in the morning, when you have high cortisol, if you're eating a high carbohydrate meal, you're gonna have high insulin. Insulin has an affinity for muscle and fat, but you can't select where it's gonna go. Oh. So immediately when your stress hormone is high and you're taking I see. a carbohydrate, you're shuttling a lot of those nutrients into fat cells. And if you know, and then like let's say you did that, and then later at night, when your cortisol drops and you have less likelihood to store fat, most people don't eat at that time. So that's actually reversed. And if you think about it, you know, um, prehistorically as well, like we'll go to the caveman example. They like to use that in science a lot. Prehistoric men, they didn't have three square meals a day. They didn't wake up with a bagel in front of them. They had to go hunt and gather and do all these things. So genetically speaking and hormonally speaking, 
the body is, has higher stress levels in the morning and it drops throughout the day and it's lowest at night and your, more, your insulin sensitivity actually increases as well. So you have less likelihood to store fat by eating a bigger dinner and a smaller breakfast or oh, skipping it all together. That's changing. You know, <laughs> it's changing totally, the idea. Yeah. It's totally changing the idea. Exactly. You know, time is keep running. You know, I would like actually to hear more from you. But one last question about sure. that. Everybody talking about these days about keto. Keto diet. Keto diet. Yeah. So what was what's a keto diet first? Okay. And so, how good is it? Okay, so so again, I mean, the keto diet's basically um, you eliminate grains and carbohydrates and, and sugary products, uh, food food items from your diet. So you're uh -huh. essentially, it's predominantly, the real keto diet is predominantly fat. So you're talking 60, 70, 90% of your calories are coming from fats. Um, and then there's different ways to do keto, but, but the dominant school is you're going to do like nuts, you know, meats, cheeses, things like that very minimal protein and absolutely no carbohydrates. And then what that does is your body has two fuel systems. It has um, glucose, which comes from carbohydrates, or um, ketones, which come from fatty acids. Right. So when, you're, when you use up your reserves, because um, glucose gets stored in the liver and in the muscle cells. So if you're not eating carbohydrates for a certain amount of days, you're going to burn through these glucose stores then eventually you're going to tap into your own body's fat for fuel and, and you'll start burning these things called ketone. Ketone bodies will produce those. Those will be your energy source. So whatever fuel source you feed your body, that's what it's going to use for fat. So let's say in the morning you have three, two or three eggs or in some avocado instead right. of like a toast. Um, so that is giving your body a lot of fat and your body sees that, hey, I have a lot of fat in my system. I'm going to switch to this fuel source because I don't see any glucose, so I'm going to use this fuel source. And then the thing is with keto dieting, it's more stable. So your body, it takes longer for your body to burn a fat molecule and process that versus a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are like high energy, fast burning fuel. So you'll notice if you eat a bagel or something like that in the morning, two or three hours later, you're hungry again. But if you have like a very heavy fat breakfast, like let's say eggs and avocado, for example, you're probably not going to be hungry for at least four, five, six hours. Um, and then once you get into ketosis, it's been shown that it increases satiety. You're feeling a fullness throughout the day. So you're talking about like a regular like breakfast? I mean, uh, without, uh, not the keto, it's more healthy. For most people, um, so there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that right now people are consuming too many grains. Actually, the, the food pyramid, if you're familiar with, um, the person who originally made the food pyramid in the United States, yes. they wrote a book saying that um, we should eat more fruits and vegetables, limited grains, and then the government reversed that and they said, we, no, we, we need to eat more grains. And she, the lady who wrote this, she said um, that if you do that, you're going to increase obesity and diabetes. And several years later, what do we have as the leading problems in here in America? We have obesity, obesity and, diabetes and diabetes are the leading problem exactly. because most people are consuming grains. So I think for most people, um, cutting that stuff out uh, as your primary fuel source would be great. But the problem I have with keto personally yes. is, is this something you're going to maintain for five years, 10 years down the line? Like, is that realistically, can you not eat carbohydrates for five or 10 no. years? Probably not. So I think it's good as kind of an immediate fix, but you want to look at how can I maintain this lifestyle? So I, I recommend something called carbohydrate cycling, where you'll do a couple of days of keto, then maybe like to your point, every once a week, every fourth day, every fifth day, something like that. You know, you, you on let's say Friday you have a family dinner, you know there's gonna be carbs and you wanna enjoy the carbs. So all week you do keto and then that Friday night you have the carbs. Have the then carbs. the next day you're back in keto. So that way you can do changing the fuel sources and that's actually been shown to be very beneficial to metabolism. Um, and also like you mentioned the cheat day. So you spike the metabolism because you keep the body guessing. It's never gonna be adapted to one way of dieting. Yeah, I see. That's too many. Uh, actually, uh, I'd like to have another, uh, uh, you know, segment with you. Sure. So this way we go through the recommendations because what you said it's like uh, changing a lot of our ideas. Yeah. And um, but it makes sense. Yeah. It makes I, sense. A, a lot of the dietary recommendations that we've been told, and myself included, from childhood, uh, many of them are not based on science. There are just some truth to them, but a lot of times it's marketing or you know, lobbyists have played a role in influencing these opinions. But when you actually look at the science, it's not supported at all. So the last word I want to just from you, where should we go 
to get the right information. I mean, what is should be online, should be, because too much uh, knowledge around or information here and there. Yes. And so where should we go to the right place and find out? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of places we can go to. Um, I mean, there's a, a lot of experts. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to call out any specific names. Exactly. But, um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you a couple. So if, if you just do the research and you go, so I wouldn't follow a random person's blog or a post, or uh, I want to make, I would say, make sure it's validated by an actual scientific trial. Um, and also, if you do research and you search online through, you know, actual like let's say university studies or scientific journals you'll find valid information and they summarize it they give you an abstract okay. i would look through that and then also in terms of you know there's a lot of doctors mainstream doctors that do this type of work i would look at their websites and you know try to partner with you know people in the local community who know this stuff something has been supported their... by researchers and studies and yeah be be more objective and critical with and skeptical when it comes to what people are telling you with regard to health or, or scientific uh you know anything with nutrition supplements be skeptical question it make sure what they're telling you is true and where's the evidence for this stuff thank you so much for this really valuable knowledge my pleasure. And uh, we, we would like to continue on this so we can educate our viewers. It, w it would be my pleasure to come back Thank anytime. you so much, Musa. Thank you, I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank uh, you. I mean, as I said, we have a lot of thoughts that we have been thinking about. We have been thinking about, for example, breakfast in the morning, it's not good. It's not good. And when you eat in the morning, it's not like we are expecting. But all the things that we want to talk about, and we have to go to the websites, and we have to see the research and so on. ف يعني الموضوع عايز بحث اكتر واكتر مش مجرد نتبع اي دايت او اي حد يقول لنا خدوا دي عشان تو لوز ويت وانا في رايي الخاص يعني المتواضع ان احنا لو كلنا باعتدال ولعبنا رياضه كل الامور هتتحل فاصل ونعود مع فضيله الشيخ حاتم فريد وعيد الاضحى وما هي الدروس المستفاده منه ابقوا معنا